So yeah, I wanted to talk about how there's always this, um, you know, there's this need to always watch, let's say, either your videos or someone else's videos. You know, I'm. It's almost like I'm seeking for relief, you know, from these videos. But recently, like, even after watching them, it doesn't do any effect to me. I don't know why. Uh, it's like, almost like as if a, it's a crack addict, you know, looking for a fix. And, mm. like, now I need to you know, upgrade my dose or something like that, you know? Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with it. Like, um, the, um, it's not that it's a bad thing listening to the videos or um, mm -hmm. being obsessed with non-duality like the last caller or the caller before was saying that there's, there's been a motion to inquire into this stuff so there's nothing wrong listening to it. Um, mm -hmm. And what it can do is in listening to it there can be a remembering or the mind can stop flipping into future and past and there can be this resonance with what is with this um, but it's not something you'll know, it's not something you can see, it's just that the mind's not going so quickly into past and future. Um, and so that's why more than likely that they're listened to again and again is because it does remind you, not you as in a person, but there is a remembering of this freedom, this stillness that you are, or the this, it reminds you, but it's not really you. There's a remembering of this. So then there's a replaying them and a re-watching them, which is um, totally okay. It's not a problem. It's not a bad thing. But ultimately, everywhere you go, everything you do, it's always this. It's not something you can get more in the videos. So if you're going home and you're getting annoyed with the traffic, so you want to listen to a video, you want to listen to Ustream or something, then you're missing this. You're missing what is, and that's all these talks are about. It's always about what's happening. It's always about um, where you are, not about where you're going. But the mind fixates on certain things as being more important, and it might have associated these talks as more important. And that's fine if at the moment that's what's happening. Eventually, this will just be everywhere. It will be seen that this was always your nature, was always you, and it wasn't really Lisa speaking to you through the computer, it was energy reminding itself that it's always free. It was energy playing the game of pretending to be trapped in this story of time, and then energy reminding itself that it's always timeless, it's always free, it's always everything and no particular thing. Um, um, that, that they will play out so perfectly You'll never understand the process. The person will never get what's going on, but it will play out perfectly. Energy knows exactly what it's doing. It's way more complicated than anything we could comprehend. And there's never an end to this. There's never a full stop to this. It's always energy expressing itself. Always. Absolute creativity. And it's so creative that it, it dreams in somebody experiencing this. Oh yeah. Um like <laughs> yeah. I guess there's nothing to do. I mean Well doing will always happen, but um mm -hmm. the person that imagines it's the doer is the illusion. But the perfect doing will always happen. So listening to this or reading books or, or remembering this when there's deep suffering or something. So the perfect doing will always happen. There's never any doing that's out of line. There's never any situation, any circumstance which is wrong. But it's not you doing it. Not you as a limited person moving through time. It's you as energy. It's you as that creative force. Not somebody inside the body, not a separate body experiencing this. The body is just used as an instrument to experience this. You as everything. So, I guess.
guess I guess listening to these videos and you know um, it has its place, right? Mm -hmm. Just like everything, and sometimes when I speak, it makes it sound like it's hopeless and there's no point listening to these videos. But that's not what I mean. But that's how it's often interpreted by thoughts. So she's saying it's not in these videos, she's saying it's not in anything in particular, therefore um, uh, it's pointless doing this. And that's not what I mean, but it's really hard to put this into words. It's just that energy um, is moving in the most perfect way, and it's waking itself up seemingly in a process in time, but then it's as it wakes up, it's seen that it was never in time. You were always this still freedom, which is expressing. It's seemingly playing this game of getting lost in the dream of forms, like in a dream at night. If you imagined, if like it, if you dream at night and you imagine that you're the separate body moving through the dream, and it seems like a long dream of forty years that you've been dreaming that you're the separate body from the dream. And then something in the dream reminds that body that it's not separate, it is all the whole entire dream. Then the dream carries on, but no longer for someone anymore. There's no longer somebody in there believing it's separate, although the body carries on as if it's separate in the dream at night. But it's never really um, somebody separately coming to remind you. It's never really somebody out there, and it's not something that the the dream character does, because the dream character is just a dream character, it's the perfect flow of the dream. It's not something that it's separately done or chosen, it's just part of the dream. And the dream is to dream that it's separate and abandoned and um, in fear or scared of life, and then life, and then the dream reminds that body mind mechanism that it was never apart from the dream and it was always the whole entire dream. It was the dreamer of the dream, not the separate body moving in the dream. Hmm. Yeah, I guess I, I don't really know exactly how dreams function, and like when we're sleeping, but so you're saying that when we dream, it's um, like. Where does that that point of view come from, though? Because let's let's say when I'm dreaming, I'm inside the dream. I only see, um, I guess. Well, actually, no, not really. I don't really see my just my point of view. Sometimes I I switch with other characters. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. And mostly, you always have to experience a dream through an object. So mm -hmm. some one object at least. You never can dream as everything simultaneously. Normally you experience it through one object. But yeah, sometimes you'll swap bodies. Um, maybe tomorrow you could swap bodies in this world. Who knows what can happen? <laughs> and look from a different perspective. Maybe, maybe it's all happening simultaneously looking from a different perspective. Or maybe it seemingly goes in time. At this t moment in time you're looking through that body and then in the future you'll look through a different body. We, we don't know how this energy is, is manifesting. It's not how we think it is. How we think it is is something that appears in the dream, so that can't be the func the, a description of how it's actually working. That would be like a cog in a machine believing that its simple um, function is the absolute reality. So, you know, like a tiny little bolt in a machine believing its little, little movement is absolute reality. And then if you zoom out, there's a whole machine functioning, and that's the same with thinking. To think that we understand it is like a tiny functioning in the dream. It can't possibly look out the thinking at the whole dream. The, the thinking is an experience, not the experiencer. We often think, though, that our thinking is the experiencer, so our description of what's happening is the experiencer. So we say, this is a bad experience, and we think that's the experiencer. But that's an experience. That's not who you are. You're not having a bad experience. There's not somebody in there that's not enjoying themselves. There's the experience of thoughts and energy saying they're not enjoying themselves. So they are an experience, not the experiencer. But the way we talk and think implies that our experience is bad. 
as if there's somebody here having a bad experience. So the person who feels that they are going through a bad experience, that's an illusion? That's an experience, yeah. There's nobody actually going through a bad experience. There's always infin in infinity having experiences. Infinity with experiences appearing in it. So the one that thinks that it's having a bad experience or a bad time or it's unjust or this shouldn't be happening to them is an experience, not who you are. But that energy becomes so strong that it takes up the whole screen and feels like who you are. And that's when suffering begins. Is that energy that's, that takes over and believes that the person is the whole show and the person is experiencing this. Whereas the person is another experience in the dream. The thoughts and the feelings aren't the experiencer, they're an experience. But that gets confused, and that's suffering. It doesn't mean that the body-mind mechanism changes after awakening. It can do. Often a lot of the trauma and the, um, uh, the negative thought patterns change, but sometimes they don't. But there's a, uh, um, an energetic movement from this tight, contracted world of me, the experiencer, to experiencing for no one, with the experience of the body-mind mechanism appearing in that. But it doesn't mean that the body-mind mechanism will be perfect in any way or enlightened. It just no longer, there's no longer this energy that that's the experiencer. When you are the experiencer as the body-mind mechanism, then there's so much suffering because it, the body-mind mechanism believes its job is to control life, its job is to control other people, and it begins to have thought patterns like, why are people doing this to me? Why is life doing this to me? And it takes life personally. Whereas the body-mind mechanism is like another, another leaf blowing in a breeze. It's subject to everything else to move. It's reliant and dependent on everything else to experience. And it bumps into other leaves and it drops out of the sky when the wind stops and it goes off in random directions and it's painful and pleasurable and full on. But it's not you. You aren't that. You are everything. Always. Mm. Yeah, I guess um, every time I would hear, um, you know, stuff like, you are everything, it never really made sense to me. I couldn't really um, make sense of it, but the dream analogy you gave really give a, gives a different perspective on it. Like I. You know, it helps, I guess. Yeah, yeah and also now it's um, an experiential thing. So now, I don't know where you are. Let me just assume that you're, say, in your office or something. And there's books mm -hmm. maybe in front of you, a computer in front of you, a window. There's light. Um, mm -hmm. There's the feeling of the chair. Um, there's maybe the side of the desk, the hand. Now, from thought... It goes, I am the body experiencing the light, the room, the books, the computer. From experience though, but we get so caught up in thought, everything is simply appearing in experience. So there's the room, the light, but in thought land, and this is the separate self, it goes, I'm experiencing, I'm a body here experiencing the room. But really, there's a whole room and a whole world appearing in experiencing but it's not for somebody there's nobody there that could be found that's experiencing this there's just everything you can't even find the position of the of an experience of the wall of the light it's not like there's a position where you experience it only in ideas and ideas and thoughts give the energetic feeling that somewhere inside the body is experiencing this but it's not true so now the sound of my voice isn't peering outside of you, 
that's just what the thoughts say it's not appearing inside of you it's appearing and you can't find where it's appearing but it's appearing in this it is this Mm. Yeah, it's not, okay, yeah, it's not appearing outside and it's not appearing inside, okay. No, it's appearing. The location it's comes appearing. from um, this thought and this energy of I'm experiencing this inside a body and this seemingly grows over time, this energy of feeling like you're experiencing this inside a body and so it, ke it, it gives the energetic expression like there's an experiencer somewhere. But that's the lie. And it's quite a change. It doesn't mean that the body doesn't experience pain or that the body doesn't have neurotic patterns. But it's an energetic shift from being somebody to being no one in which all of this is appearing. And it's not about making yourself perfect or getting rid of pain or acting enlightened in any way. It's that shift from me in relationship with things to life and it's the end of all hate even though the body might say don't do this or I don't like that or leave the room or I don't like you whatever the body does there's no longer somebody in there with the arrogance of saying this is me this is them I'm better I'm lower it's just appearing in this Like your nature is everything, has no judgment. Although the body might have judgment, but that's not who you are. It's just appearing. <laughs> so don't look to the body or the thought patterns for freedom. We often look to the body or what the thoughts, I mean, I have some really freaking random thoughts. And, um, and this body has some random, um, like, uh, habits, like... Um, like the things it likes and doesn't like but it, it don't look to the body for freedom don't look for your behavior for freedom don't look for your thought patterns for freedom it's that which everything's appearing in and it's an energetic shift from me my body my world to everything but you won't find it in what you think you won't find it in controlling your behaviors and your habits Like I'm sure if somebody followed me around with a car with a camera, people would be stunned at what this body gets up to. Like um, <laughs> it doesn't line up with my imagination beforehand of like um of what she would be like. She's she's uh, she carries on being Lisa. You mean if someone followed you? On the streets with the camera. Well, the somebody, yeah, followed me around. They'd be like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> and maybe, and maybe now I'm more extreme because I don't care. Yeah, it's it's funny when you were um, telling me how your voice isn't inside or isn't outside, um, and, and I kind of felt that I was trying to perceive it inside or outside, but your voice was just appearing. Just like um, everything else, and this is where the love affair really is. It's the end of any judgment of you and your position. It doesn't mean that the body, I'm not talking about the body, but I'm talking about you have no position. The problem is the one that feels like it has a position and it's just, an, it's just a thought pattern with an energy, me experiencing, and that's the lie and that's where all human suffering came from.
I wouldn't judge your listening to these videos or anything because I can I can feel that it's really res beginning to resonate there not just with my videos but any other speaker that resonates it might feel like an obsession at the moment but I would just ignore that <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess. Um, its way out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess it has its place, and I don't know. I seem to really like listening to these type of videos. It's what this body mind mechanism does. I can't guarantee it did. I can't guarantee it, but I would listen. I would play it all night. So I would go to bed, and I would just have it. When I was listening, it was CDs. It wasn't YouTube. Mm -hmm. So I would just have my oh, CD yeah. player under the bed, even my cassettes actually, it was sometimes cassette player, under my bed and I'd have a little speaker and I would just let it play all night until it ran out. Yeah. And then I would wake up and when I was driving I'd, ha I'd listen, um, when I was doing the gardening I would listen or walking the dogs I would listen. And it was like, it wasn't even that I was really listening because you, I listened so much, it was like a, sometimes it would be intense listening but a lot of the time it was like it just was r relaxing that person that was looking so hard. So it was like a meditation, but without me knowing it was a meditation. It wasn't an active mm -hmm. one. But that might not be the same for other body mind mechanisms. You never know how it plays out in each specific one. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, a lot of people true. have different reactions, you yeah. know. Um, like. My sister, she doesn't like these type of videos. She kind of like yawns. To it. <laughs> She's like, oh. especially um, she was like trying to listen to like hard Tolly ones, and she was like, you know, he's really interesting, but like he's so boring. <laughs> <laughs> I actually really like it, Cartel. I, I feel like he's so so funny. Yeah, like he could be a stand-up comedian or something. Yeah. You know? really His timing is just so perfect. <laughs> but. Yeah, there is the relaxation um, when I listen to these videos, but I just, um, at the same time, I don't want to, you know, like I said, I don't want it to be like uh, like a crack addict, well, you know, That's got to play support. its energy out. I was always the opposite opinion. I wasn't on the opinion of restraint, although I went through a period of restraint when I was a Buddhist. It's like... It's like that obsession's got to play itself out. You try and stop it short and there will always be a nagging feeling to, to do it. It's like if there's a sex addict, it's like, well, bonk as much as you like then. It will eventually run itself out, that energy. If, you, if, there's, if the person then tries to restrain it, it's like that energy's always hiding there in the body. And I don't mean to say, like, if you're, you're a drug addict, go and blow your brains out. That's not quite what I'm saying. That's what people are going to interpret what I'm saying. Yeah. But it's like, it's like this, hiding, this hiding feeling of this energy that wants to express itself and do something. And then who's the one that thinks it knows better? Mm -hmm. Like, we don't know what's happening. Yeah, there's always this question where you know there's an, a, a desire to do something or the, this feeling and then I'm like hmm, no maybe that's not a good idea but yeah. uh, I guess the energy should be played out. Yeah, the, what Ramesh Balsaka used to say which I really liked but this could be interpreted in so many different ways he used to say uh, in every given moment do exactly as you feel like doing knowing there's nobody doing anything and the way that I interpreted it latterly, although I don't think of it much now, um, is that the person that thinks it knows what the body should do is an illusion. So it's like the less and less you think you know who you are, the more and the more the body will just function and do what it wants to do. But we're so scared of that because we've been taught for so many years of what we should be, what we think we know we should be. And so it's like um, the body knows its natural impulse, that then there's a natural impulses in the body and then the mind comes in and judges whether that's right or wrong. And then it would be and then his the the kick to it was knowing there's nobody ever doing anything. It's not really you that's doing it, it's just the way the programming is. So there's the original urges of the body and then there's this mark, this thinking mind that comes in and sometimes it's practically needed. So sometimes the body might be going to do something really stupid and it's practically needed, but a lot of the time it comes in and thinks that it knows better. And how do we know better? 
Are we sure we know better? But it yeah. re that resonated with me with Ramesh. Ramesh Balsakar was, I don't know if you know him, he was um, uh, an Indian speaker. He died in 2009, but he was the translator for Nisargadatta Maharaj. And, um, and he taught for 30 years from his apartment. And that, that, that line for me really resonated, or for this body really resonated, because there was quite a strong feelings in the body. So it was like uh, for, for this body, that resonated. For other bodies, it might not. But the body, there wasn't a really strong intellect here. So the body did know what to do. So in every given moment, do exactly what you feel like doing, knowing there's nobody that does anything. And so this body did know what to do. But it had been taught so many for so many years, the sort of patterns have been taught of don't trust that, you've got to do it like this. You shouldn't do it like that. And so now a lot of the time it's just impulses and it's a feeling, like an impulse, a feeling comes up, and it's not really inside or outside, it's just an impulse, and then movement happens. And then sometimes the mind interferes. And who knows, some people might say that's being or not being, I don't know. Sometimes the mind comes up and says, that's not a wise move. <laughs> and then sometimes that's listened to and sometimes it's not. <laughs> it's also funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, you said Ram Ramesh. Balsaka. Uh, but he's uh, uh, Bal Balsaka, okay. yeah. Um, uh, how do you spell balsa? I knew you were going to say that. Hang on, I'm just going to use, look it up. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, but he's not so popular now because because he latterly spoke really um, bad English because he used to take his teeth out. He was like 93 when he died. And he used to take his teeth out. And so a lot of people can't understand him. I, I spent so much time listening to him that... Um, that uh, that I can understand everything he says, but uh -huh. I posted one of his videos and I realized that most people are like, what the hell? What's he speaking about? <laughs> okay, let's see. His famous, there we go. So Balsaka is B-A-L S-E-K-A-R and his famous uh, book, okay. Ramesh Balsaka was Consciousness Speaks, but there's some videos of him younger, but with an Indian accent and no teeth, it's um, I can understand why. This is this is just um, an example of him speaking. But this, this is, is impersonal. This is him younger. So the individual is um, is a, a play character. It, it comes into being. It goes out of being. Yes. It is a it is a character in this play that is life and living. Mm -hmm. Now, from the viewpoint of the individual, though. This is him. Um, yeah. Latterly, this is maybe when I saw him, 2008. Yeah, maybe a bit before that. Yeah, yeah, I used to go and see him in India. But you see how bad his voice is. And then there's a beeping, but I can hear what he says, and he says, That's exactly what I found. But I can see. <laughs> yeah, it's very hard for people to understand with the noise in the background. And so he's he not a lot of people know about him when I speak of him now. But he used to be very famous um, um, non uh, advaita speaker, but not since mm -hmm. YouTube took over. But before, before okay. when it was more kind of word of mouth yeah. and people, you didn't. There wasn't like a lots of um, like a social media around it. Yeah, thank God for YouTube, huh? Yeah, it's great. It's opened it up in a whole new way. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you know, he he kind of reminded me of I don't know if you ever watched the movie Kung Fu Panda. Oh yeah. The turtle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his face does look a bit like that. <laughs> he was such a handsome man when he was younger. Um, he used to be a weightlifter, and he did loads of things wow. in his life. But the, but he's ninety. I think in this video that I've got now, two thousand eight, he must have been like ninety three. So, oh, wow. Yeah. He's written some like thirty books. So there's loads out there. Ah. Uh. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, that was a great talk. Yeah, that was lovely. Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you very much. Nice to speak to you again. <laughs> you too. Bye-bye. Take care.